Thank you for joining us at One Church. If you'd like to know more about us, you can simply visit our website, onechurchjoplin.org. We would like to stay connected with you throughout the week wherever you go. And the simplest way for you to do that is to like our Facebook page, where we post all of our content. And you can always come visit us Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. or 11 a.m. I believe that you're here for a reason and God has something he wants to say specifically to you. And my hope for you is that by the end of this video, you feel closer to God than you ever have before. This gift, it's from my husband, and I know what it is. To be honest, I don't know what it looks like or what color it is, but I know what it is. He told me the year we got married, what he would get me this Christmas. I just never thought this Christmas would be here. So I know what it is, and I know it won't work, but it's the thought that counts, right? Let me back up a little. I always knew I wanted to be a mommy. That was probably one of my biggest dreams. And when I met my husband, I knew that he would be a great dad. I was just sure of it until I wasn't. It happened slowly. I didn't notice at first, but after a while, the cute little jokes that friends would make and the comments that came from family saying that it just takes time, it became more defeating than encouraging. Each fertility test just seemed to be another accusation of somehow, some reason, that I wasn't meant to be a mom. But I knew I was. I had to be. I remember thinking, God sure has a strange way of doling out kids. It's actually kind of scary how many dark places my mind has gone over the years. I wondered what I had done wrong if I was being punished somehow. I'd even convinced myself that somehow God had abandoned us in our pursuit, our dream to be parents. I thought maybe if I prayed more, if I trusted more, believed more, but after all the years of praying, trusting, believing, all I was left with was a broken heart and empty tissue boxes. I, we had learned just to live with broken hearts. It's just the way it was going to be until it wasn't. It was December 21st, two years ago. I remember because I opened my advent calendar. There was an extra chocolate in there, and those are always my favorite. But it wasn't the chocolate that day that, that was the most important to me, and I've kept this with me. The scripture that accompanied the chocolate says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. He has commissioned me to encourage the poor, to help the brokenhearted. In Isaiah 61.1 In this prophecy about the coming Messiah, God assured me that not only did he want to, that he had not forgotten us, but he also wanted to help us. Well, that seed of hope finally found its way to my heart. And yes, God does seem to dole out kids in a strange way. And I realized that we didn't have to experience the miracle of birth to experience the miracle of a child. So while all our friends went to Lamaze classes, we met with social workers, lawyers, notaries, social workers, more social workers. It took longer than nine months for us to become parents. But this little miracle, he was worth it. In my wildest dreams, I could not imagine how God could orchestrate this for us, but he did. You know, just the other day, God reminded me that on the first, very first Christmas, 
He provided the baby Jesus in a strange way, not the way that we all would have expected it. Then he reminded me that because of that baby Jesus, I am his adopted child. And if he loves me as much as I love this little guy, then I don't ever have to question his presence in my life. Oh, and this present, it's a Chiefs jersey. My husband's favorite team, but not ours. (laughs) And like I said, it won't work because his favorite team isn't mine and it's not gonna be his either. Good morning, One Church. See, you're better than the first crowd. They were a lot quieter and more subdued. I like that. We are in week four of the gifts of Christmas. This week is the gift of adoption. This is a beautiful story. I love it. Um, We're going to jump right in here. I love the story of this. I love this little skit, and I love the moment when the the mom says, you know, we had had resigned ourselves that we were never going to be parents. That was the way it was going to be. And then she smiles and said, but it wasn't. And I think too often, that's our own lives. We look at our situation, we look at the world around us, and we think, this is it. This is the world I'm living in. This is, I have to accept this. Then God whispers, but it isn't. And then there's a time, I think, where we think to ourselves, I'm not good enough. The life I've lived, the things I've done, I can never be part of anybody's family, especially God's. And then God whispered, but it isn't. Jesus came at a time when people, according to the scriptures, people were living in darkness. Imagine living in a time where the government says, everybody up, everybody march, go stand in line, go be counted. Imagine a trip to the DMV that takes months. It'd be very defeating. Have you been to the DMV lately? Holy cow, I went to get a driver's license the other day, and they said, you have a piece of mail with your name on it. I said, well, I got that. He goes, no, 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 bills. I don't get bills in the mail. It's all email. He goes, you got to find something. I went, I, I, I don't have anything. Luckily, I found something. But, and then they give you this piece of paper like this. It's, well, it's this big. The paper's this big. And I don't know. I just, never mind. So let's look at a scripture here. 1 John 3, 1. It says, See what sort of love God has given to us, that we should be called God's children. In this verse, John overtly tells us that God has given us a great gift of being his children because of his great love for us. The original language not only communicates this as fact, but also demands that we take a deep and joyful look at just how much God loves us, that we are now part of God's family as his children, and that his calls for enthusiastic and outward celebration coupled with an inner peace that comes with such security of belonging. Peace is a byproduct of belonging in a secure family that is based on unconditional and unwavering love like God demonstrates and offers as a gift to those who would receive it. Peace. It's a funny word this time of year. There is no peace. There's no quiet. There's, no, there's just crazy madness. The shopping, the present wrapping, the, the planning for parties, the planning for dinners, and the families coming, and the house is a wreck. Peace is not something that seems to come around this time of year, but it is something that happens when you are a child of God. There is an inner peace that comes with you. There's a security. There's a family that envelops you. John 1, 12-13 says this, But to all who have received him, those who believe his name, he has given the right to become God's children. Children not born by human parents or by human desire or by a husband's decision, but by God. Here John is referencing the gift of adoption. You know, adoption is this beautiful thing. If you look at adoption in our world, you know, adoption is this thing that, you know, we talk about and and we see. And, you know, I'm surrounded by people in my own life that are either adopted or in in the process of adopting. And I just think that it's this beautiful thing. And God is talking about that here. He's adopting us into his family as part of his family to be his child. Have you ever sat around your Thanksgiving table with your whole family and thought, maybe I am adopted? I know that I have multiple times, and and then someone reminds me that I act just like so-and-so, and and I go, that's not even even sure. I thought you liked me. I didn't realize you didn't like me that much. In God's family, we were all adopted. We were adopted into love. We are adopted into grace. We see this the first time in the Bible. Paul talks about this in Romans. 
8, 14 through 17, he says this. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery leading again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by crying, by whom, whom we cry, Abba, Father. I want to stop there for a second. I love the term Abba, Father. If you look it up in the, if you look it up in, if you Google it, well, actually, if you Google it, you get a lot of songs from, you know, you get a lot of 70s disco. But if you get down to the real meaning of it, the translation of Abba, Father is an intimate term for father, daddy. I like to use the word daddy. You know, I always tell people, anybody can be a father. It takes a real man to be a daddy. And I know that when your kid calls you father, you have messed up big time. My dad called me, my son called me father one time, and I went, what'd I do? I know what I did. But the first time you're called daddy by one of your children, there's this beautiful moment of, they do like me. They do love me. Finish the scripture here. The Spirit himself bears witness. The Spirit itself bears witness to our, to our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, then heirs, namely heirs of God, and also fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so we may also be glorified with him. Paul was reminding us, reminding the Christians at Rome, that when a person becomes a follower of Jesus and receives the Holy Spirit into his or her life, that, that person has been the recipient of the gift of adoption into the family of God. Not only has our status changed as a son or daughter of the king, but also we have become rightful heir with Christ to all that comes with being a part of the family of God. In this little skit, the mother reads this verse from the Advent calendar, and she says, God has chosen us to bless the poor, to encourage the poor and bless and help the brokenhearted. God has chosen us. We are adopted. I was telling the first service, I don't know, you look at me, you can figure out real quick. I did not play sports in high school. I was a band nerd obviously you know so when the, so in elementary school when it was time to play sports i was not the first person chosen we played basketball pick up basketball i was the guy that everybody went all right sean come on because i was not i was slow i didn't shoot very well football i didn't like to get hit baseball well you got to be able to throw the ball accurately to play baseball and i just couldn't now kickball on the other hand first guy chosen right here but for most sports I wasn't chosen. For most of anything, I wasn't chosen. So when, when, you, when I hear that term, God has chosen us, there's something about that. There's something beautiful about that because, you know, in life sometimes we wonder if we're chosen for anything. You know, yeah, our spouse chose us, unless you're some of us who think, just thinks, she got stuck with me. But we love to be chosen. We love to be saying, I want you for this. And so God tells us that. This is who we are. This is God's family. This is what it means to be a child of God. Where there is God, where there is Jesus, there is family. God has an adoption plan. God says, you, if you, God says, you feel unwanted, come here, I've got you. God takes us all, and God takes us all because God is love. I keep hearing that word love. I keep hearing that over and over. We're going to get into that in a second. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 says this. Even as, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us, the beloved. I love that before he cho even, before, even before the foundations of the world he chose us. Before there was nothing, he chose us. I mean, that, that's some hardcore love right there because in, the, in reality, before the foundation, before he did anything, he chose us. I'll read you this a little bit about adoption in this time period. In Roman law, the one being adopted was removed from his previous family state and placed in a brand new relationship as a son to his new father and thus new family. If the son had any debts from his previous family, those debts were canceled, and a brand new life with a clean slate was part of the benefits of being adopted. This adopted son was now under the control of his new father and responsible only to him. It was normal for his newly adopted son not only to be formally recognized as a new son of the family, but also to become a rightful heir to his father's estate, just as if he was a blood relative. God loves us and adopts us as his own. I'll, you know, oftentimes you'll see an adoption happen. You'll see somebody adopt 
a child. A lot of times it's from the same social status. Sometimes it's not. But God adopts us where we are. He adopts us in our mess. A minute ago we talked about not being worthy, not feeling worthy. It doesn't matter. God still adopts us. Paul talks about this in Galatians. Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the appropriate time had come, God sent out his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we may be adopted as sons with full rights. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, who calls Abba Father. Once again, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. So you may no longer be a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you're also an heir through God. I love that. So you are no longer a slave. You know, I tease my son all the time that I had a son because I was tired of mowing the yard. I hate mowing the yard. And so I say, I had you so you could mow the yard. And, and you know, oftentimes he'll come in and he'll go, Dad, I'm not your slave. Well, you kind of are. I, I, kind, I kind of pay your ways. So you kind of are. But, you know, the Bible says that we are no longer slaves, but we are a son. In those verses to the church in Galatia, Paul basically described the why and the when of Christmas. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a virgin, to redeem us and adopt us as his own. When we received the gift of adoption that came at Christmas and we put our faith and hope and trust in Jesus to forgive us of our sins as he, and become, as he becomes our Lord and Savior, we then have peace. We have peace with God. There's that word again, peace. And peace knowing that we're not only saved from sin, death, Satan, and hell, but also that we have peace knowing that we are secure in a family with a Heavenly Father who loves us unconditionally with a perfect kind of love. That is the nature and the character of our Heavenly Father. He will never turn us away. He always takes us as his own. You know, our earthly parents are not perfect. Trust me. We all, I'm a parent. I'm not perfect. I screw up on a regular basis. But the beauty of this is God takes us where we are. He takes us where we are and who we are. He doesn't care about our past. He doesn't care about our future. He cares about our future, but not our past. God takes us. I can promise you that if you look at the Bible, and you look at the people in the Bible that God chose, some of them he chose to do fantastic things. Some he chose just to be there. You know, and you look at, you say, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to be a son of God. Well, look at the Bible. David. David was a murderer. He saw a woman he wanted her, so he sent her husband off to be killed in battle so he could have her. Moses freed the Israelites, but yet he killed someone before that. Paul, one of the most prolific writers of the New Testament, wrote half the New Testament, killed Christians. He killed Christians for a living before he became, before he became a, a, a son, an adopted son into the family of God. The disciples, they were fishermen. They weren't they didn't run big churches. They weren't pastors. They were fishermen. They were simple fishermen. And that's all they did. But yet God said, I, I need you to come follow me. And he said, they said, why? Why us? Because I've chose you. And then you look at Mary and Joseph. Mary was just a young girl who had lived her life right. She was innocent. She was pure. But then there's Joseph. I love Joseph because... God chose Joseph to be his son's father. Joseph was just a carpenter. And if you read the rest of the Bible, you don't hear a lot about Joseph later. He didn't go off and write books of the Bible. He didn't go off and minister. He raised Jesus. But he was just a simple carpenter. And then one of my favorites in the Bible is Rahab. If you remember, if you heard the story, when the Israelites were preparing to go into the promised land, they sent spies in. Two of the spies went into, Jer went into Jericho. They were protected by a woman named Rahab, she was a prostitute. So she did. And you say, well, great. She saved two lives. But if you read the first chapter of Matthew, which, by the way, if you ever read the first chapter of Matthew, it's very difficult to read because it's so-and-so begat, 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 and it gets really hard to read. But in that scripture, in that series of scriptures, is the name Rahab. And people say, well, what does that mean? That means because of her faithfulness here, she was mentioned here as a member of the family of Jesus. I mean, how cool would that be to be able to say, that's my cousin, that's my nephew, that's whatever. But because of her faithfulness, she was a prostitute. 
So for us to think that we're not good enough for Jesus, we're not going to be in his family, is ridiculous. I can promise you I know people in this room. I see people in this room. I have friends in this room that I can promise you 20 years ago, if you just said, this is where you'll be in 20 years, they would go, no, nah, there's no way. 20 years ago, they would say, God doesn't need me. God doesn't want me. I don't even believe in him. But here they are. They're here. 20 years ago, there are people in this room that God said, you're going to plant a church one day. No, I'm not. When we planted this church, there were about 18 adults in the, in the, that were part of it. And none of us, not all of us came from a church background. A couple of us were, one of us was a preacher's kid. That'd be me, by the way. If you didn't figure that out. But I never planted a church. No one else did. We didn't know how to plant a church. And 20 years ago, none of us wanted to plant a church. Some of us weren't even Christians 20 years ago. But yet, God said, you're going to plant a church. Okay, let's go. And there are people in this room, and we're in this room earlier, that have been up here on this stage and they have spoke. And 20 years ago, they didn't even believe in Christ. Or 20 years ago, they were living a life that was not a Christian life. Because you see, God doesn't care about our past. He didn't choose you because of your past. I think churches sometimes often try to, try to, try to push that, that you have to be clean to be a part of the family of God. I know that several years ago we had a band here. We had a, 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 a concert in Mohawk. This is many years ago. Uh, and New Song was the main band. And the, one of the guys from New Song, Pat, he, he spoke after the concert. And he said that churches often preach Okay, you want to be a part of the family of God? You want to be part of this church? Go get yourself clean. Go get off the drugs. Get off the alcohol. Stop with your adultery ways and then come to church. But that's not how it works. God says, come to me. I came for you. I didn't come for you to come clean. I'll clean you. I'll take care of that. You just come. We think we are alone. We think that this broken heart is a permanent thing. But we accept that this is the way it's going to be. But it isn't. God says, come here, sit at my table, hold hands with my family. You know, if you've been around long enough around here, you know that we have a lot of messages that involve being around the table. It's probably because Shane and I are both fat and we love food. But there is something fantastic about sitting around the table with your family. There's this moment where, I know for us, for Thanksgiving or Christmas meals, there's this moment before we eat where we stop. We take hands and we pray. And right before we do that, there's this quietness that falls across the room. And you're looking around and you go, this is my family. You love them, love them, or sometimes love them a little less. This is my family, and they're part of who I am. When Bev and I first moved to Joplin about, I don't know, we've been here about 16 years now, we didn't know anybody. I had one friend. He was uh, known him for years, but he had a busy life. He was a single guy with a new daughter. Um, and... He was busy, so we didn't get to see him a lot. So we joined this church, not this church, but a church. We met these people, Shane and Julie, who are not here today. We became friends with them. And the first Thanksgiving we were here alone without our families and couldn't go anywhere because of our jobs, Julie's dad called me and said, please come have Thanksgiving with us. Please come to our house. Okay, sure, why not? If you ever met Rex, you don't turn down. You don't say no to Rex. You just don't. And so we got there, and we had dinner. And he said, what are you doing for Christmas? We don't know yet. He said, well, if you're here, he said, you have a seat at my table. Anytime my family gets together for a meal, you have a seat at my table. That meant something to me because I didn't know this guy very well. I knew him well, but not very well at the time. But he said, you always have a seat at my table. There's something about being with family. There's something about being in the room surrounded by your family and sitting at a table and breaking bread together. And that's what Christ wants us to do. Come sit at his table. You know, it's like being asked to sit at the captain's table. Because that's the table we all want to get to. Because that's what he does. That's where this happens. I'll read this for you. That is the heart of our Heavenly Father. Giving you a place to belong and a place to experience as part of the family. In this video again, the mother says, God has chosen me. God has chosen us. We are his adopted God has chosen us to encourage the poor and to help the brokenhearted. This is who we are. This is God's family. I love the Bible, and I love reading. Max Lucado wrote a book called 316. 
And so it's a book that talks about the most famous scripture in, in all of Christendom, John 3.16. It's up there on the board thing, on the screens. And I love John 3.16. Max Lucado says that if we had no other verse in the Bible and we had nothing else to read, that this one verse could sustain us through anything. Because this one verse wraps up Christianity in one verse. Everything that is about being a, a child of God is in this one verse. And I love the King James Version. Normally I read the New Living Translation, but for some odd reason, I love the King James Version of this scripture. And I'll tell you why in a second. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, and that's why I love the verse, whosoever, it sounds inclusive to me. Whosoever. It's not calling out a denomination or a race or a height requirement. It's calling out whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Does it matter? Whosoever. That includes all of us. I can tell you now that I've actually got my own translation of this scripture. This is what my translation says. It says, For God so loved the world that he sent his son to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect life, to be arrested, tried, beaten, whipped, crown of thorns placed on his head, nailed to a cross with three nails, put up to die, his side pierced, laid in a grave, and three days later came along. So that blank. The blank is your name, Kevin or Caleb, Amber. That's the blank. That's why he came. He came for you. He didn't come because he wanted to. I have this vision in my head, and I know that it's silly, but I see the day that they decided, or day, but the moment they decided that this was going to happen in heaven. And in my mind, because of what I do for a living, I see them sitting around a boardroom. God's at the head of the table, of course. Jesus is here, there. Holy Spirit's there. Of course, Michael, the archangel's there, because you've got to have your general. And they're waiting patiently for their last person to get there, which is Gabriel, the herald guy, the trumpet guy player, because musicians are always late. Gabriel comes in, and so God goes, these people are in desperate need. They're in a dark place. What do we do? Of course, Michael's first answer is flood. God's like, no, we've already done that. We probably have to do that again. The military guy's first idea is to start over. But Jesus says, I have an idea. How about I go down there? And I, and I become I'm born of a virgin, and I live a life, and I go through all this stuff, and I let him kill me, and you bring me back to life in three days, God, and I sacrifice myself for them. God goes, when do you want to leave? And he says, today too soon. Because God, Jesus did it for you. There was no doubt in his mind, except for one moment, one brief moment in the Garden of Gethsemane where he said, Father, if this cup can pass from me, please let it pass from me. But then he says, not my will, but thine be done. Because he said, I will do this. And he would do it again today if we needed him to. He came to this earth to adopt you. So the question this morning I have for you is, what does that mean to you? What are you going to do with this information? The Bible says right here, God chose us to encourage the poor and help the brokenhearted. Maybe today you are the brokenhearted. Maybe you are the one that, maybe today you're the one that, you say, I've never accepted this invitation to be adopted. I've never accepted it. I've just, I've heard about it. But I've just never said the words. Or maybe today you're in a place where I said the words once before. But I'm at a place in my life where I'm confused. I'm struggling with my faith. I'm struggling to believe. I'm struggling to understand. Or maybe you're at a place where it was so long ago that maybe you don't remember. Maybe you just feel like you're lost. Or maybe you accept the invitation, but it stays in this room. Sunday after Sunday, you come in, you listen, and you walk away. And you don't take it with you because I'm going to tell you right now, the whole purpose of this is to take it out of this room. It says to help the poor and the brokenhearted. To take it out of this room to the city of Joplin and beyond. Because I'm telling you, as I said this before in the last service, there is a world out beyond these walls that is dying and going to hell. And they need the love of Jesus. Are you sharing the love of Jesus? Are you, are you loving people? Are you loving your family? I know that's hard sometimes, but you can do it. 
Are you loving your neighbors? Including the neighbor that runs his blower all the time. 12, 14 hours a day seems like, all through the fall. There's not that many leaves in my neighborhood. I promise there's not. But he runs it every single day, all the time. You have to love him. He needs Jesus. But are you loving your neighbor, your coworkers? I can tell you now that I have coworkers. Are we live? Never mind. Um, you have to love the people in your life. You have to love the ones that aren't in your life. You have to pray that God puts people in your path that need him. So I ask again, what are you going to do? Are you going to take this invitation? Accept it. Are you going to take your status, your new status as a son or daughter of Christ and take it out of this room? Because if you're not, maybe you should think about that. So I say again, what are you going to do? Let's pray.